I'm going to ask you, if you would, to take out your Bible and also take out your message outline. And this morning, I promise you, you need a message outline. You will be lost without it. Guys, make sure everyone gets one. So uh, make sure that we have plenty. Um, I, if you need one, you lift your hand, and these guys will make sure. Uh, Tommy, kind of look around. I'm not sure that we have somebody right here. So uh, we want to make sure that we have everyone an outline. Last winter in January, we began a semester on Wednesday nights of something called Secret Church. And um, it was Secret Church where we studied cults and counterfeit gospel. Now, some of you are wondering, what in the world is Secret Church? We're going to explain that in just a moment. But it was a powerful and rich time. In fact, listen to this, over a hundred new people began coming on Wednesday nights from this crowd. Over a hundred new people began coming on Wednesday nights. It was a, a, a time of, of rich study, midweek encouragement, a great time. So, instead of trying to get you to come there for the first one, we decided to come here for the first one. So, this is Secret Church on Wednesday night. Um, you are here already. We're proud of you for being here this morning. And um, we are giving you a little taste of what we're going to be doing over the next few months in Secret Church as we study the issue of heaven, hell, and the end times, a very interesting topic. You know, it's been said, if you really want to grow a crowd, start talking about the end times. People are always interested in that. We often feel it when things are around us. There's different movements through the millennia that have come along. But there's nothing that points toward the end times perhaps as much as when we see the persecuted church. Now, the church has always been persecuted. The church has been persecuted from the very first century when Jesus commissioned us to go forward. In fact, there were great persecutions in the first 300 years of the church. Um, but we also know that Matthew chapter 24 says that the persecution will become very strong once again. We in the Church of America do not experience very much persecution. I know that there are some in this room who do. Some of you have family, or some of you have friends, or some of you have co-workers that truly persecute you. And I believe that it would be good for all of us to, be, to, to recognize that in this room this morning, that there are brothers and there are sisters in this room this morning that are mistreated because of their faith in Jesus. And they're mistreated on a daily, weekly basis um, because of that. But for most of us, we've not experienced that kind of difficulty. But we are not the norm. There are millions and millions of Christians, listen to this, hundreds of millions of Christians who have met today, this day, this morning already before us, who live under persecution. And so, Secret Church is a reminder of, to us of what is happening around the world of the, of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ who is being persecuted, but how is it that they worship and how is it that they grow in, their, in the midst of their persecution. What they do is they have in-depth study times where a lot of material is covered, and they open their minds and their hearts to the opportunity that is there. Very often when Marcy and I lived in North Africa, I would go and I would spend time with small groups of guys and gals, and I wouldn't have um, just week after week after week where I could be with them. Instead, I would be there for a few days. And when I was there for a few days, they would call the guys in from other towns, and they would call them together, and they would say, hey, we're going to have a Bible study. And when you say you're going to have a Bible study in North Africa, that may mean that you're going to have a Bible study for a few days or a week. And we would literally meet for days on end, and we would cover a fair amount of material at one shot. And that's because the opportunity wasn't like it is here. Well, this morning, part of what we're covering is the picture of the persecuted church needing the encouragement and the truth by which they can live and continue. And we, as a church, need to remember our brothers and our sisters around the world. I want you to look at this map and notice here that the, gr the darker the color, the darker the orange, is the greater the persecution. 
extreme persecution in certain areas of the world, hundreds of millions of Christians under persecution. When I was 19 years old, I went to Czechoslovakia. That's back when it was still Czechoslovakia, not Slovak Republic and the Czech Republic. And in the middle of the night, we would meet with college students. And we have a picture. I took this picture when I was 19 years old, where college students would come together who were being persecuted on the campuses um, of Czechoslovakia. And we would do Bible teachings with them. In this particular picture, a professor from Wheaton named Dr. Jerry Root um, was there, and I was just privileged to be tagging along as a 19-year-old. I've seen what it looks like to do secret church. I've seen what it looks like for people to travel from a long distance to get a big dose of the gospel and a big dose of God's teaching. Over the last 40 years, we've seen China open up. We've seen China go from a totalitarian regime that would not allow any Christian movement to being somewhat open after the 1990s, and the gospel began to be able to be preached openly and even churches to be able to exist. But as we've seen in recent months, there has been a greater and a greater persecution over the last two years, in fact, of China. Um, Chairman Xi has just come and determined that the Christian church is a true threat. And so in these particular uh, provinces that you see right here, the Sichuan province, there are tremendous difficulties that are, that are there. These are big modern cities that are beautiful cities. They have all kinds of amenities and all kinds of wealth that are in many of these places. But the, and there's over 100 million Christians here. Here's a picture of the Hilton um, that is there. I mean, it's, it's five star. It's pretty beautiful. But there are Christians, listen to this, over 100 million Christians meeting now under persecution. They are meeting under the threat of police coming in and pr- coming and destroying what they're doing or taking folks away. People out in the countryside, people in big cities. This next picture, go to the next one there. This is the people in the far western region of China up along the Mongolian border. Um, Uyghur Christians that are there, they're called the Uyghur people. And, um, but not all of them meet in remote places, some of them in beautiful worship centers. Here is the picture of a pastor who has been arrested. Last December he was arrested, he has been in jail all this time, and he's not been able to see his lawyer one time since he was arrested. This is a tremendous um, difficulty as the early rain church is under great persecution. I want to encourage you as you look at the next couple of pictures to recognize that we have people that came from Sheridan Hills that are ministering in this environment, and even three weeks ago while we were meeting here and they were meeting there earlier in the day while you were still asleep, police came in under the commands of the police and under the commands of Chairman Xi the police came in and arrested 15 people from our friend's church. They collected all of the cell phones, and here's pictures of similar events happening just in recent months. The police will station somebody there with a body camera. They will record everything that's happened. The freedoms of China are going away very, very fast. In fact, in defiance of that, this group of young Christians met and posted their picture and said, we will not stop worshiping and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Wang Yi is the one who is in prison, and he is the one that at this time, we we don't know what's going to happen with him. There's many other pastors who have been arrested in recent days. So how is it that the church continues under the times of great difficulty? Friends, It is the Word of God that the church must embrace and that the church must hold on to that gets us through the difficulties of times like this. This is the reason our church studies the Bible, not just so that we can weather persecution from a government, but because we live in a fallen world that wants to destroy your faith. For some of you who have yet to come to faith in Jesus Christ, I want you to know that the the devil in all of his ability is seeking to hold that back from you, wanting to distract you from the true gospel of Christ. 
But God's grace, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, he brings people from behind the walls of Islam, behind the walls of communist China, from behind the walls of popular material America into saving faith in Jesus Christ. So I want to just encourage you as we go into this time of remembering the persecuted church and studying in depth a particular subject, as we study heaven, hell, and the end of the world, we want to be remembering what God is doing through His Word and what He is doing as we look at this important subject. We've already studied cults and counterfeit gospels, and now we come to heaven, hell, and the end of the world. I, I just want to also say to you, this is not, this isn't on your outline, but I want you to see these. This is not a time of entertainment. When we come together and as we meet each Sunday or as we meet on Wednesday nights, this isn't about entertainment. This isn't about enticement of some sort or even intellectual intrigue. That's not what this is about. And this is also, it's, it's not about a nice sermon or an in-depth Bible study as much as we are going to study the Bible. No, you see, the whole reason that we come together and the whole reason that we even have intense times like Secret Church is so that we can gain, and as we gain in the knowledge of God and the truth of God, so that we can go. You see, the, God, the Holy Spirit's plan has never been to just have well-fed Christians who are not working in His plan. It is God's design that we be passionate about what he has done to save us and that we be passionate about taking the truth of the gospel to a fallen world who does not know. This is why the believers of, Ch of China are, are displaying such beautiful resolve. Many of them, hundreds of thousands of them, millions of them are saying, I will not bow to any other idol. I will not march to any other drum, save the drum of Jesus Christ. That is the only one. So the whole purpose is that we can equip, and if we are equipped with the knowledge of God's Word, we can live and proclaim that Word. And so that is the whole point of this. As we've said this last fall, we studied cults and counterfeit gospels, had a great time with that, or last spring, we studied cults and counterfeit gospels. Now, we come to heaven, hell, and the end of the world. Take your outline, and uh, as we get going here, I want you to see um, some great, great truths as we look and as we see. As we come to this issue of heaven and hell and the end of the world, there's a lot of intrigue about this. It is an interesting subject. It is interesting to look and see what does the Bible really say about heaven, and what does the Bible really say about hell. In fact, in our present society, there's a lot of people who prefer one over the other in study and in belief. They'll say, oh, I believe in heaven, I just don't believe in hell. That's a very unpopular, you know, that, that, that can't be really true. How in the world would that really work? Well, we want to look and we want to see that. And what about the end of the world? I mean, Aren't there these nut jobs on the radio and on television that are always talking about the end of the world? What is the story with that? We're going to look and see what this looks like and what does God's Word say about these three things. And the reason that we want to do that is so that we can be equipped to live and be based upon these things. Each one of these three areas can encourage your faith. You mean the truth of hell can encourage your faith? Absolutely. You come and you'll see why, why we would say that. So where do we begin? The first thing that we need to do as we do this and as we start this study and fill this in, we need to pause. We need to take time and pause. That's part of what Wednesday nights are about. That's part of what Sunday mornings are about. It's about us pausing from the busyness and the craziness of the world that is around us and being still before God and before one another. You see, we need to recognize that we are continually blinded by the temporal. Circle the word temporal under that. These are the things that are short-lived and that are passing away. And we are subtly numbed by the trivial. That's all the things that really don't matter. 
and even Christians that come to Sheridan Hills, we can be obsessed with the things that aren't really going to matter. In fact, as we, as we look at this and as we consider heaven versus hell and the end of the world, we start to, if you, if you start to think about the magnitude of those issues in all of eternity, and then you evaluate where you've spent a lot of your time and where you've spent a lot of your concern this week, is any of that really going to matter 10 years from now, let alone 10 billion years from now? Think about the things that we obsess about. Think about the things that on social media that we spend hours and hours and hours perhaps looking at, or the, the, the entertainment, all of the, all of the storylines that we follow, and all of the, all of the movies and the, and the entertainments that are there. We can become so obsessed with the temporal things that are passing away, we ignore the very issues that are so eternal that God's Word is so clear on. And so, we are often tempted to look at the temporal and the trivial and make them so important. What we need, and look at this and fill this, in, or just kind of underline this, we desperately need to contemplate the eternal. This is hugely important to us. And the world does not ever encourage you to do this. The world is always looking at the right here and the right now, what about today? And we see in God's Word a long-range view. One of my favorite pastor authors, A.W. Tozer, um, went home to be with the Lord in 1963, so five years before I was born. Notice what he says here, and this is on your outline. Notice what he's talking about, about looking at the eternal. He says, let no one apologize for the powerful emphasis Christianity lays on the doctrine of, underline it, the world to come. Right there lies its immense superiority to everything else within the whole sphere of human thought or experience. When Christ arose from the dead and, descend, and ascended into heaven, he established forever three important facts. Namely, that the world has been condemned to ultimate dissolution. The, the human spirit can persists beyond the grave. You're going to go beyond the grave. And number three, and that there is indeed a world to come. Circle it. The church. The church is constantly being tempted to accept this world as her home. And sometimes she has listened to the banishments of those who would woo her away and use her for even their own ends. But if she is wise she will consider that she stands in the valley between the mountain peaks of eternity past and eternity to come. The past is gone forever, and the present is passing as swift as the shadow of the sundial of Ahaz. Even if the earth should continue a million years, not one of us could stay to enjoy it. Underline this, we do well to think of the what? the long tomorrow. So here we are between these two things. And if we are going to come to this, if we need to come not with the pride of this life, but we need to come, fill it in, we need to listen with humility. We need to listen with humility. You know, when you stand in a valley and you look up at two huge mountains around you, I've been in the Alps, been in the Rockies, it's just amazing how humbling it is. You sit there and you just look at it and you go, wow, that's so big and I'm so small. That's kind of the way we should feel when we come to this valley between eternity past and eternity future. In our present, that we look at all that God has before us. Look at Matthew chapter 24 and verse 35. And I'd like to ask you if you would read Matthew 24 verse 35 out loud together with me. Are you ready? Here we go. Heaven and earth will pass away but my words will not pass away. This is the base point of where we start. How do we know about heaven and hell? How do we know about the end of the world? It has everything to do with what Jesus has said. It has everything to do with his words. In fact, notice this and be ready to underline this. Look what it says there. Let's minimize the thoughts of man and magnify 
the truth of God. We need to minimize the thoughts of man and magnify the truth of God. Now, there's all kinds of things swirling around in our culture about heaven, about hell, and about the end of the world. There's all kinds of things. We have the thoughts of man everywhere. There's everybody that has these opinions or these experiences. In fact, Marcy and I were shocked when we came back to the United States after living overseas for a long time. We came back, and you know, when you get away from something for a while, and then you look at it again, it's kind of like your children. If they go on vacation for a while without you, or you go away for a business trip, you come back, and just in a matter of a week, you're sitting there, you go to look at them, and you go, wow, they, 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 they've grown. Have you ever experienced that before? Your grandchildren, you haven't seen them in a while. You're shocked at how much bigger they are. Things change when you're not there. Well, that's how we felt when we came back to the United States. One of the things that we noticed when we came back to the United States is Americans are, are always talking about things that are, that are very spiritual, even people out on the street um, talking about things that are spiritual. And among Christians, we noticed that there was a strong trend about eight or ten years ago of really talking a lot about experiences, sensational experiences with the Lord, sensational experiences of even going to heaven or visions of heaven, going, going and, and having these out-of-body experiences. Um, even when we came back here, there were a lot of people when we would sit down and talk, there were rather fantastic things that people would often talk about. And this has really played out with, with this fact. Do you know what the number one selling book in the last 10 years among Christians was? The number one selling book in the last 10 years was this book right here. Look what it says. Heaven is for real. It's a, fan, thank you, it's a fanciful account of a four-year-old boy who talks about how he went to heaven and got a halo and wings, but they didn't really fit very well. They were too small. He claims that he sat on the lap of Jesus's, he sat on Jesus's lap and had angels sing to him. He even met the Holy Spirit who he described as kind of blue. And over 10 million copies have been sold. That book is not to be confused with another best-selling book entitled The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven. I know it's kind of confusing because there's two of them, but the second book is A Boy Who Came Back from Heaven, heaven written by a, name, a man named Kevin Malarkey. <laughs> no pun intended. Yes, pun, pun intended. Kevin Malarkey. And listen to this. Malarkey had a six-year-old son named Alex who had made multiple trips to heaven and back after a car accident. Alex claims to have seen Satan many times, who he describes as having a funny-looking mouth, a few moldy teeth, no noticeable ears, and two bony arms and two bony legs. Now, what's interesting about this is, is that the entire story the malarkey story, was confessed as a lie this last summer. How about these books? Notice these books are not to be confused with My Journey to Heaven, What I Saw and How It Changed My Life by Marvin Bessman, Flight to Heaven by Dale Black, To Heaven and Back, A True Story by Mary Neal. 90 Minutes in Heaven by Don, not John, Piper. Nine Days in Heaven by Dennis Prince. 23 Minutes in Hell by Bill Weiss. Now, none of these books you will find in our bookstore. I promise. Make no mistake that there is money to be made in peddling fiction about the afterlife life as nonfiction in the world of Christian publishing today. Lots of money to be made. That's what's so disturbing about this entire trend. These books are being published and then devoured by people who would describe themselves as being born-again, Bible-believing Christians. And all of that shows that our level of discernment in the church today on this topic is extremely low. Because the whole premise beyond every one of these books is completely contrary to what God's Word says about heaven. These books do not line up with what the Bible says. 
John MacArthur, a pastor in California, sums it up this way, really looking, and this is also on your outline there, Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 4 and John 3 and verse 13, though this quote is not on your outline, but I want you to hear what he says, and I put it on the screen in front of you. Here's what he says about Proverbs 30 and John 3, 13. For anyone who truly, truly believes the biblical record, it is impossible to resist the conclusion that these modern testimonies, these books, with their relentless self relentless focus on self or self-focus and the relatively scant attention that they pay to the glory of God are simply untrue. They are either figments of human imagination, dreams, hallucinations, false memories, fantasies, and in the worst cases, deliberate lies, or else they are products of demonic deception. He continues on. He says, we know this with absolute certainty because Scripture definitively says that people do not go to heaven and come back. And here's Proverbs 30, verse 4. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? The answer to that is in John 3, 13. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. So Scripture clearly says you don't go to heaven and come back. All the accounts of Scripture concerning heaven are this. They are visions, not journeys taken by dead people. And even visions of heaven are very, very rare when you look at the whole Bible. You can count them on one hand. In fact, there's just four biblical authors that had visions of heaven and what they had to say about that. And here, think about it. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, Ezekiel, Paul, in John. All of them, listen to this, were prophetic visions, not near-death experiences. Not one person raised from the dead in the Old Testament or the New Testament ever wrote down what he or she experienced in heaven. And that includes Lazarus. Lazarus was in the tomb for four days, and we have no record of what his experience was there. That was not the focus. That was not the intent. That wasn't the picture. You see, one author put it this way, Dr. Dwayne Grudem. Listen to what Dwayne Grudem, the, the author of um, Systematic Theology, look what he says. All the biblical authors who saw heaven and gave, comparative, and gave comparatively sparse details, yet they agree perfectly. Their visions are all fixated on the glory of God, which defines heaven and illuminates everything there. They are overwhelmed, chagrined, petrified, and put to silence by the sheer majesty of God's holiness. Notably missing from all the biblical accounts are the frivolous features and juvenile attractions that seem to dominate every account of heaven currently on the bestsellers list. You see, the bestsellers list are just looking at the friviality, the fanciful ideas, the experiential things, that the focus is on the person who went. But what we see in Scripture, both in the descriptions of what God's glory is all about, and even those who had visions of heaven, it's all about God and not about everybody else. You see, we were made for worship of God, and this is what is happening. Why then, why are we buying this stuff when the Word of God is so clear? And fill this in on your outline. We need to minimize, or just underline this part where it says, let's minimize, underline this, the thoughts of man. And let's maximize, this is right in the middle of your page one there, let's magnify the truth of God's Word, the truth of God. Notice the next part there in those two verses, Proverbs 30 and verse 4, who has ascended to heaven and come down? Surely you know. Verse John three thirteen. no one has ascended to heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. So the next thing there at the bottom of page one, you want to see Let's lay aside our traditions and submit to the Word of God. You see, it's not about the traditions of what all we believe or what all we see. Flip the sheet over there and look there on the, look at Matthew chapter 15 
in the very end of Matthew chapter 15 at the top of page two, look what it says. So that, so for the sake of your traditions, you have made void the word of God. Would you underline that line? It's the last word. That's what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees. He's saying, you have, you have held up your traditions and you have ignored what God has clearly said. We should not do that when it comes to heaven, hell, and the end of the world. I want to tell you, I have a godly mom and dad who love the Lord. And I grew up in a good church, a church that loved the gospel. But as a child, somehow the culture's view in the 70s and in the 80s Concerning, concerning heaven was that it's all about what you would like. What really came through to me was, you know, what kind of, what kind of go-kart are you going to have in heaven? Or what kind of boat are you going to have in heaven? What kind of tree house are you going to be able to build in heaven? I really thought that heaven was all about our pleasure, my pleasure, and all of these things. The, the deeper truth that there's a great, huge creator God who made us for his worship, and a deeper truth of a great, huge creator God that made us to be at our very best when we properly see him wasn't what got through to me. Very often, I was very distracted by those views from our culture and didn't really understand that we were made for God's glory. Look at the next part there. Let's leave room as we study over these next few months. Let's leave room for disagreement over the secondary and the tertiary doctrines. Those are the things that are not critical doctrines while celebrating agreement on the primary doctrines. We're going to have to do that as we study on Wednesday nights. We're going to have to look and see what are the parts of this, because because there's so many different views on the end times, and there's so many different views on what does this passage mean about hell, what does that passage mean about heaven, how does this work. There there are some parts of that, they're not critical to our salvation, and there's different different schemes and understandings. But, you know, we're not going to focus on all the charts we're not going to, there's some people who have made out the end times charts, you know, the timelines. And a lot of people, um, even while they're not date namers, they still are, are looking for this sequence of events very carefully and they interpret that through one lens. We're not going to do that. We're going to do something much broader than that. And I believe something much more powerful than that. We're going to look at the base things that Christians need to see that will affect the way that they live and be faithful to the Lord. Go to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. He says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling, to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness. We've already said we need to come to this with humility, with patience, bearing with one another in love, and then underline this, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So we need to be careful to do that as we do our study. As we do that, we need, to, we need to go through a little bit of theological triage. Theolog- you think about this. What is the triage unit in the hospital? Triage unit in the hospital is, is when people come in the door and they have to det- we have to determine how sick is this person, how urgent is their need, especially if there's been um, a major event occur, maybe a, a bus accident or, you know, some type of, you know, maybe a hurricane or, or something like that. The people in the hospital are sitting there looking at the people coming in the door, and they're looking for the people that most critically need help right now versus the people who can wait a little bit. And that's kind of what we mean about theological triage. We need to look and see what are the doctrines that are absolutely critical that we believe, the primary doctrines, versus the ones that, you know, that, that's not quite as high a priority for us to be together on. Notice this, and notice on your outline, get ready to fill this in. That first bullet point says this, Christians divide from non-Christian, so Christian versus non-Christian, over, circle it, primary doctrines, and are willing to die for these doctrines. You see, this, is, this primary doctrine type thing is, is the humanity and the deity of Jesus Christ, the fact that Jesus was God, that, that's a primary doctrine. I'm willing to die over that doctrine. The substitutionary death of Christ for my sins, I'm willing to die over that. 
There is no other reason for his death than to save sinners from sin, and that is the only way. How about the resurrection of Jesus? I'm willing to die over the resurrection because if Christ be not raised, my faith is in vain. He is is the one that has the power to overcome all of my sin and all of my foolishness and eventually overcome my fallen flesh that dies. What about justification? The only way that I'm made right before God is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. I'm willing to die for that. Now, this is, this is an important issue. These are primary doctrines. This is what separates Christians from non-Christians. We see through the Reformation that all of this came up again really big, and that there were people that were saying, no, it's good works and faith. It's Christ plus you. And there were guys that went to the stake. There were men and women drowned in the lakes of Switzerland over their faith in Christ alone. How about this next bullet point there? Churches, churches distinguish themselves from one another over secondary doctrines, yet they partner together around primary doctrines. That's, that's part of the idea that, you know, we're Sheridan Hills Baptist Church, and there's St. Um, Andrew's Presbyterian Church just down the road. Now, we have some differences in view on baptism. And while we would be both clearly claiming Christ is the only hope for our salvation and very joyful about their faith in Jesus on those things, we would say, hey, on the baptism thing, you need to look again. We'd say, we love you, and we'll even share the gospel with alongside you with other people and and everything else. We'll, We'll work together, but we'd view some of these things a little bit different. That would be a secondary doctrine. Look at the third bullet point that is there. Christians in the same church, Christians in the same church disagree with one another sometimes over the tertiary doctrines. Those are the things that are that are much smaller, and those are some of the things that we'll study about heaven, some of the things that we study about the chronology of end times. There may be some things that one guy in our church kind of takes this view, and one gal in our church kind of takes this view, and we would say, okay, we can be in the same church. That's not something that affects our covenant together. It's not something that greatly affects how we practice our primary and secondary theology, but we have some different views. There's room for that at Sheridan Hills Baptist Church. We can have some different views about how exactly the end times works through and what some of the things are and how we study that and how we name that and how we work through it. So here's the picture. This does not in any way decrease the intimacy in our fellowship with one another. It shouldn't. Now, there are some people who get all wound up about one particular view of Revelation or one particular view of Daniel or Ezekiel, and they have no tolerance for anybody. They, they've got their system all worked out. And I want to say to you that, that I want to encourage us not to be like that, that we want to be very careful as we come to the Word of God to see what the primary issues are, see what the secondary issues are, and we may have some different views concerning what we call the tertiary or the smaller things that are there. Here's the guiding principle. Here's the guiding principle that we need to see. The guiding principle, and this applies to much of the church and much area of the church. In essentials, that's primary doctrines, like salvation through Christ, in essentials, we have unity. We gotta have unity on the essentials. But on the non-essentials, we have liberty. Um, Some would say we have charity. Um, this is the idea that we, we're unified on the things that are most important and on the things that are secondary, we allow one another to have perhaps a differing view. You see, but above everything on this, we need to live with urgency. It won't do us any good to learn what the Bible says about heaven and learn what the Bible says about hell and it remain in intellectual truth without it coming down and gripping the values of our heart. In fact, you can't truly learn it and it not affect the values of your heart. You see, this truth should change the way we live. This truth should change the way that we view the people that are around us, that we no longer see them as just the guy at the end of the street that has a nice lawn, and I see him every now and then. We see him as a human, immortal being 
who is going to live forever in one place or another. That we no longer look at the people around us merely as mortals, but we begin to see them as made in the image of God and that they will be either everlastingly with God or everlastingly separated from God under condemnation. That is the reality of what this book says. That is not a particular theological fad. That is the as ancient as the glorious truth of God's Word upon the earth is that we are made for His glory. We have sinned against Him and fallen. He has come to rescue, and we either accept or reject His rescue. Jonathan Edwards said this, and do you see these words that are here? Jonathan Edwards, one of the great intellectual minds of America in the early years, even before we were a nation, said, resolved to endeavor to make my utmost to act as I can think I should do if I had already seen the happiness of heaven and the hell torments, and hell torments. Here's the picture. He's saying, I want to live as if I've already seen heaven and as as if I've already experienced hell. You see, if you had experienced heaven and you had experienced hell, how would you live in this life? We see it through the Scripture. We see it through the heart. And with 4.7 billion people at the bare minimum who have never heard of Jesus Christ, it is not something that we can waste our lives over. God is calling us to embrace the reality of eternity with urgency. Look at the next bullet point there. We need to live with urgency. We need to have a height of confidence that has no fear in the face of the future. Philippians 1, 21, I mean, here we see Paul had no fear of the future. He said, for me to live is Christ and to what? And to die is gain. Paul didn't have fear of the future. He knew what God's word said. He knew his Savior. Not only the height of confidence has no fear in the face of the future, look at the next one, the breadth of compassion that compels us to lay down our lives for the lost. Are we really willing to die for the lost? Notice this, the apostle Paul is writing and he says that he's willing to go to hell for the lost. Look what it says on the next page, top of page three. He says, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. He's saying, for the Jewish people that are not yet accepting Jesus as the Messiah, he says here, I wish I could go to hell for them. Now friends, that is compassion. Notice Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Therefore, we have surrounded, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy, see his joy, that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and seated and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary and faint-hearted. You see, we need to remember that Jesus went all the way to the cross so that we could be saved, and how we need to compare ourselves to his compassion all because of his grace in our lives. Look at the next part there. We need to remember with urgency with this, with a depth of courage that defies death in this world. You see, death in this world is not the end for the true Christian. It's really only the beginning. And when you take away the fear of death, and when you take away that fear, you begin to really live Look at Revelation 2, verses 9 through 10. It says, I know your tribulations and your poverty, but you are rich. He's talking about you are rich spiritually. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are, of synagogue of, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison that you may be tested, and for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death 
and I will give you the crown of life. You see, Pastor Yi and so many of the other pastors that are across North Africa, across India, across China, across various areas of the world that are, that are saying, man, Revelation 2.9, 2.10, that's my verse. We have had friends that have humbled us that are North Africans, that their willingness to go to the persecution, to run to the battle so that people would know Jesus. One of my friends was, we were talking about the very real possibility of his death because of his faith in his Muslim family. He said, well, maybe if I die, more of them will believe. Wow. Do we think like that? Maybe if I die, more of them will. He didn't have a death wish. He was simply acknowledging that if I die, Many will believe. In fact, we'll see quotes from North Africa. Look at the next part. May loyalty to God be more important to us than life itself. Is life the thing? You know, in America, we talk about safety, safety, safety first, safety first. We talk about the most important thing is safety. The most important thing is safety. My friends, what good is your earthly safety if your eternity is in grave danger? There is something that is far more important than earthly physical safety, and it is spiritual safety in the arms of Christ. And that only comes through faith in the gospel of Christ and what he did on the cross for us. May our loyalty to God be more important than life itself. How about this one? We need to hear the testimonies of the Old Testament saints. Look at there, and and just kind of notice that I've highlighted that. I've, I've made that underlined in bold. We need to remember what the Old Testament saints, what their faith was like in the face of death. Look at Hebrews 11, verses 13. It says, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having a knowledge that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. You see, this is the true picture. For God's people, this is not our home. Look at the middle part of that. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they have been thinking of that land from which they have gone out, they would have the opportunity to to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Isn't that beautiful? That's the picture of faithfulness to God and the fact that they are living not for this life, but they're living for the life to come and that God loves that. God is going to reward that. God is saying, I am your God if you trust in me as I have said. Look at the bottom of page three. Also from Hebrews 11, some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even change and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goat, destitute and afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all of these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. You see, Old Testament saints were looking for the promises of God. Look at the next part here. Hear the, testament of, or hear the testimony of New Testament apostles. So these are the apostles. And look at this, Acts chapter 5, 29. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. You see, they were told, stop preaching in the name of Jesus. And they just stood before the Sanhedrin and they said, we have to obey God, not you. They, Jesus had just been murdered. Stephen was to be stoned. And here they're saying, we will obey God, not you. Look at Acts 5, 40, just a few verses later. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. 
And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. That means the Messiah is Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah, the anointed one was Jesus. Look at Acts 14, verse 20. But when the disciples gathered around them, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples. And then look at this, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And it goes on and on and on. As you look at the New Testament apostles, they were meeting resistance. They were meeting conflict. They were being even beaten and put to death. And they knew that there was a higher kingdom that they were living for. Look at the apostles that is here on page five. Look at the top. Um, The martyrs throughout history. See, these apostles weren't only beaten during their life, but they were put to death. With the exception of John, who died um, eventually of old age, all of the other apostles were recorded in Christian history as having been put to death. Look what it says. Matthew suffered martyrdom by being slain with a sword at a distant city of Ethiopia. Mark expired at Alexandria after being cruelly dragged through the streets of that city. Luke was hanged upon an olive tree in the classic land of Greece. John was put in a cauldron of boiling oil, oil, but escaped death in a miraculous manner and was afterwards banished to Patmos. And then he wrote the book of Revelation. Look at the next. Peter was crucified at Rome with his head downward. James the Greater was beheaded in Jerusalem. James the Less was thrown from the lofty pinnacle of the temple and then beaten to death with a fuller's club. Bartholomew was flayed alive. Andrew was bound to a cross where he preached to his persecutors until he died. Thomas was run through the body with a lance um, at uh, Cornodale in the East Indies. I don't know where that is. I need to look that up. Jude was shot to death with arrows. Matthias was first stoned and then beheaded. Barnabas of Gentiles was stoned to death at Salonika. And Paul, after various tortures and persecutions, was at length beheaded at Rome by the emperor Nero. Keep on going there with Justin Martyr. No one makes afraid or leads us into captivity as we have set our faith on Jesus. For though we were beheaded, crucified, and exposed to beasts and chains and fire and all forms of torture, it is plain that we do not forsake the confession of our faith. Would you underline that? It is plain that we do not forsake the confession of our faith. But the more things of this kind which happen to us, the more there are others who become believers through the name of Jesus. Marcy and Cheryl Ann and I are right here. Cheryl Ann is is here this morning. Um, And we have stood in the arena of Carthage. And in the arena of Carthage, a young lawyer went to see the games that were going to be played that day. And the games would open up with the persecution of Christians in the third century. And this young lawyer went and he watched Christians being put to death. And one thing that he noticed was the more we put Christians to death, the more they multiply. And one day while he was watching Faith in God unto death, he had this thought and later wrote it down. Look what it says. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. This blood is being spilt into the sand of the arena in front of us, and it is resulting in a whole crop of faith in God as he would have watched Perpetua and Felicita as they were put to death. Charles Haddon Spurgeon would say it like this, never did the church so much prosper and so truly thrive as when she was baptized in the blood. The ship of the church never sailed so gloriously along as when the bloody spray of her martyrs falls on her deck. We must suffer and we must die if we are ever to conquer this world for Christ. 
And my friends, that is not the message of many churches. The message of many churches is come, Jesus the genie, if you rub the lamp right, will pop out and give you what you want. But Jesus' message was come and see, stay and die to yourself and to this life, and then live forever with me. Go and tell. And so Spurgeon nails it when he says, the church thrives under pressure. Folks, I'm not asking for it. I think it's coming. I'm not wanting more. I'm not, I'm not wanting to be a glutton for punishment in this. But what we must recognize is that those who are being persecuted for the sake of Christ doesn't mean that they're doing something wrong. It probably means they're doing something right. And for some of you, it doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong. It probably means that you're doing something right. Amen. As you quietly, lovingly, humbly have faith in Jesus. I'm not saying go out there and be odd for God and let persecution come and, and you did equate. You know, don't let the problem be with you. Let the problem be with the gospel. Look what another pastor from, London, or from England would say to us, we do not know the value of Christ if we do not cleave to him unto death. The true message of the gospel is, is that we hold on to him unto death. And then we hear the words of Jesus. Jesus in his own words says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 26, so have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. He's saying don't fear those who are coming after you. It's every, the, the truth is going to be known. Look what he says. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So here we get this little picture, already a glimmer of the, the reality of heaven and the reality of hell and the reality of our call to live in faith in these truths. So we begin to, bottom of page five, we see with an eternal perspective. That's what Christians need to do. We need to see with an eternal perspective. We need to see the big picture that goes all the way. And not only do we need to see with the eternal, eternal perspective from Colossians 3, but also we need to speak with a holy boldness. God is glorified when we speak with a holy boldness. Look what it says in Acts 1.8, and I'd like for you to read it out loud in light of this, the, the speaking with a holy boldness. Would you read Acts 1.8 out loud with me? Let's read. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You see, God has called us to speak boldly in a world of that's fallen and desperately in need of him, that we are not ashamed of the gospel. Notice the next one there, fill it in. We sacrifice with reckless abandonment. This means that we give ourselves, we give our lives to the truth of the gospel. Look what it says in Acts 10, or in Matthew chapter 10. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Yes, indeed, the call is hard. The call is big, but the call is glorious. Now, one of the great things for us to consider in this, in many churches, you know, they're more concerned about just, just keeping the church together, especially as the culture heats up and things kind of go nuts. We just, we need to maintain our own church. We need to maintain our buildings. We need to maintain our group. Notice this, fill this in. May mission in the world be more important to us than maintenance in our churches. <laughs> and that may mean facilities maintenance. We have a bunch of old buildings. We have to work on it. We know what that temptation is. There's many churches, if you were to ask them, what would you do if suddenly you were given a large gift of money? The, the, the vast majority of it, it would all be spent on the facility. 
And I, I can tell you that Tommy and I and uh, the PST and the, the other pastors, we, we, we look at the things around here that are, that are needing, and, and you know, that would be a great temptation. But the church is so much more than a bunch of buildings. The church is so much more than that. We need to have the mission of the gospel. We need to have the fact that there are people both locally and globally who do not hear the gospel. We need to recognize that we need to have a one that we're concerned about. This isn't about just come sit and soak and be blessed and go. This is about come be equipped so that we can proclaim the message that we see throughout Old Testament and New Testament that people give their lives for the sake of the gospel. And that today, that there are people giving their lives in China and in North Africa and in India for the sake of the gospel. You see, all authority, Matthew 28 says, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And look what he says, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. God has called us to depend upon him all the way through. As we close, look at page seven, the top. John Piper puts it in this way. When you know the truth about what happens to you after you die and you believe it and you are satisfied with all that God will be for you in the ages to come, that truth makes you free indeed. Underline that. That truth makes you free indeed. Free from the short, shallow, suicidal pleasures of sin and free for the sacrifices of mission and ministry <clears throat> that cause people to give glory to our Father in heaven. You see, once we are owned by the gospel of truth, once our lives embrace that this is talking about for keeps, for all of eternity, and once we come to become comfortable with the persecution of this life and the, even the loss of life, that we are ready to live the gospel. So what do we do? We need to pray. We need to seriously pray. Jesus in Matthew chapter 9 prayed. He told us to pray. Look what he says. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You see, they're just in a fallen world and everything around them, from their religious leaders to their physical circumstances to their, their poverty, everything about them caused them to be sheep without a shepherd. Then he says, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, underline it, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. When we think about heaven, hell, and the end of the world, we need to be prayerful. We need to be prayerful that God would be continuing to send out laborers and that we would be willing to be those laborers, that we would be willing to say, Lord, here am I, like Isaiah, send me. And why do we do this? This is for our lives are at stake for eternity. That's the first part. You see, it's whether you believe the gospel or you don't believe the gospel. It's about whether you have embraced the call to, the, to die or you haven't. And I mean, Jesus says, unless you're willing to come and die, you cannot be my disciple. Jesus said, come and die to yourself. Die to the lure of this world and embrace the call of eternity. So it's not only about our lives, but fill this in, it's about others' lives are at stake forever. God has called us to recognize that the people around us are either going to be everlastingly saved or everlastingly lost. This is his design. So what do we do? How do we look at this? Look at Revelation 20, verse 11 through 15, and I'm gonna close with this. Look what it says. John writes of the prophetic vision that he had, not his presence, but John writes of the prophetic vision he had. In Revelation 20, 11, he says, then I saw a great white throne in him who seated on it, in, in him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. 
And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Church family, we need to see clearly not what culture says about heaven and hell and the end of the world. We need to see what God's Word says. And I want to say to you that despite what we read in Revelation 20 and verse 15, and not really even despite of it, but because of it, the gospel is good. Jesus saves us from the lake of fire. If you don't have a real view of hell, how can you appreciate heaven? God has called us to recognize the grand plan and to see it clearly. And that's what Wednesday nights are going to be about as we go. But for some of you, it's right now that you're saying, I need Christ. I need Christ. I would call you to cast yourself upon the glorious sacrifice of Christ. Put your faith and your hope solely in Him. If He is calling you today to say, no longer do I live for myself, I die to myself, and I want to live to Christ, listen, say yes to that. Repent of your sins. Believe upon the one who saves. The Bible says all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I would say to you this morning, call upon Christ. And for Christians today, be encouraged. Be encouraged that the glorious gospel is for us to proclaim and to share with others, and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. Would you stand with me for prayer?